Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'm Allison Daly, founder and CEO of Recruiting Innovation, and I am proud to be your host for this month's leadership series as part of our Ernestine McClendon Talent Grant. I am more than thrilled to introduce our guest today, Leslie Vickery. She is the founder and CEO of Clear Edge Marketing, which is a real um, one of the, the main and, and sort of pioneering marketing firms within the talent recruiting space. They have a, a wider reach than that, but Leslie um, has a podcast. She hosts women's events. She is um, a, a well sought out speaker at everything related to, to marketing team culture, talent, um, personal branding. And so we are in for a real treat to have her as our guest today. So thank you for being here, Leslie. Allison, thank you for having <sighs> me. And yes. Um, thank you for having this grant too. It's such a wonderful yes. opportunity. I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of this group. Thank you. Yes, we, you know, part of, of, of the talent grant is not only to kind of create opportunity for people to come and become uh, certified tech recruiters and grow as recruiters in the market, but I think, you know, as an industry, recruiting is one of the most approachable industries for all walks of talent. Um, whether you have an MBA or a GED, as a recruiter, you can, if you like to work with people and you're tenacious and you like to connect people with opportunities, you can really grow your career here. And part of the, the leadership series with the talent grant is to just get to know folks who come from different spots that land in talent because there is a million roads to, that lead to Rome. And so part of that, I would love to hear Leslie, like, how did you get started in your career? And I, you know, what were the sort of the stepping stones that led you to, to launching Clear Edge Marketing? Sure. Thank you, Allison. And again, please, everyone, as we're presenting here and, and chatting today, feel free to ask questions in the chat or give feedback. I'd, I'd love to hear from you and learn more about each of you throughout this. And as I mentioned before, we'll have plenty of time for, for Q&A. So my journey, and I'm going to take you back a little ways because it all really comes full circle when you think about you know, what it is that you want to do and where you kind of end up in your career. So I'm not sure where many of you are in that process, if these are career changes or uh, just something that you're getting into at this stage. And I can tell you firsthand, being an entrepreneur, now I've had uh, this company for 15 years and I've been part of starting other companies as well, which we'll talk about it really wasn't my vision or dream. And I'll talk a little bit about that kind of going into that. And entering the staffing industry, I had never really heard of the talent space uh, whatsoever. Uh, my dream and passion really started in high school and that was writing. I had a journalism class and I was able to tell a story of someone in one of my classes who was uh, consistently bullied at school. And I really felt for him. And I remember sitting down and interviewing him and feeling like, oh my gosh, you have this incredible story that no one in our school really is aware of. So I got to write and tell his story. And right there, I really fell in love with the journalism side of writing and being able to write and tell other people's stories and journeys. So from there, I stuck with journalism. I studied it in college, uh, journalism and PR. And that was my dream was to continue to write. Uh, I'm from Michigan, grew up in Saginaw, Michigan. and. We, uh, I remember my dad vividly, it was literally like right after graduating college, I said, I'm moving to Colorado. So Allison, I didn't know it, but I wanted to be closer to you. And he said, I just don't get it. Why, why would you want to leave Saginaw? There's so much here to offer you. And I just felt like there's so much more in the world that I didn't know. And I ended up landing an internship at uh, Vail Mountain to do broadcasting. So I was following my, my dream. And I got in my car, which was a Pontiac T-1000. So for those of you who don't know what that is, it's not a car meant for the mountains, but bottom line. <laughs> but something that really started my journey, and I didn't realize it at the time, was uh, watching for signs and thinking about your network. So something I would really encourage you to think about. And when we talk about personal branding a little bit later, one of the things that uh, really made a huge difference for me was as I was driving away from our driveway, my next door neighbor who I went to high school with came running out and he gave me a slip of paper. And he said, Leslie, your dad told me you're moving to Colorado. Our 
friend from high school, Stacy lives there. She lives in Denver. Now I was friends with her, but not really close friends, more acquaintances. And meanwhile, I drive to Colorado. I'm so excited. I'm following my dream. I've made it. I've got this internship at Vail to do broadcasting. And uh, I also, by the way, was going to be working at the mountain to actually make money, um, attempt to make some money there. I had maybe $300 to my name and a, and a credit card with a small limit on it. Didn't have any money, all my belongings in my car. Got past Denver and right around the Evergreen area, my car broke down. And this is before cell phones. So I took that little piece of paper. I had to cross the highway, go to a restaurant, use a pay phone. Thank God I had the fortune, good fortune of having AAA. AAA towed me to Denver, but I called my friend Stacy, who again, we were just acquaintances. And I said, hey, this is Leslie Vickery. I don't know if you remember me from high school, but Chad is my next door neighbor. I know you're good friends. He gave me your number. Anyway, long story short, I ended up not having enough money or means to get back to Vail. Stacy took me in and I lived on her couch for, slept on her couch for some time. She managed a restaurant and uh, got me convinced them to hire me as a waitress. And I, I waited tables. So it was one of the most eye-opening journeys of my life and my professional career to feel like I was going to find this passion of being this journalist, you know, hard-hitting journalism and veil. <laughs> but I was able to, in my mind, have this stepping stone for where I was looking to go. And that was sidestepped. It was completely taken away in a minute. And uh, so here I'm waiting tables, living on a couch. And my parents were like, listen, you've got this degree. You need to do something with it. So I ended up through another connection. So again, going back to the networking piece, getting a job with McDonald's Corporation in internal communications. Now they also had a TV studio, which would broadcast out to all of the restaurants. And I was going to be trained to do the, the broadcasting side as a backup. So I go through this training and I'm basically told your hair is wrong, your voice is wrong, the way you dress is wrong. Like all of these things were wrong about what I was doing. And I realized, you know, it wasn't the broadcasting piece that interested me so much. It was the writing piece that I loved so much. And I decided, um, you know, maybe broadcasting wasn't for me and not just because of that one person, but it does fuel into the story of having confidence, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And I really focused more on the writing aspect um, of, of my career. And from that point for about a year, I had some really interesting opportunities uh, brought to me. One was being the, uh, the CEO at the time. So imagine I'm all of, I don't know, 24, 25, the global CEO of McDonald's, his name was Ed Renzi. He was on the board of Junior Achievement and they asked me to be the liaison with Junior Achievement. So I did that. It was an incredible opportunity. I remember sitting down with uh, Mr. Renzi at the time and not being too intimidating, but I had some good lessons learned there. And a mentor who was my boss um, had taught me a lot of lessons such as, this is going to sound so basic, but I walked into that meeting with the CEO and I didn't even have a pad of paper, a pen, a laptop, nothing to write notes with. I walk in and now she's feverishly writing notes. We walk out and she said, Leslie, don't ever go into a meeting again with the CEO without you know, taking notes and whatnot. So it was that little moment of her explaining that to me. Again, a, a lesson that you'll notice if you ever see me in meetings or something, I'm diligently almost taking verbatim notes after learning that. And that has really helped me over time. But the key there going back to the network is junior achievement. So I made the connection with junior achievement. And from there, I decided big corporation wasn't for me. Colorado was for me. I'm going to resign and move back to Denver. And my parents thought I was crazy. Here I landed this, you know, great opportunity, a big company, global um, access and, and tremendous opportunity. I continued to write for them freelance, but I reached out to the contact at Junior Achievement, who then introduced me to the head of Junior Achievement Denver. And guess what? They had an opening. They had an opening for an event planner, PR person, communications. And basically it expanded my knowledge of marketing. So I went from waiting tables, so dream of journalism, going back, 
writing internal communications, and then from there expanding my knowledge, continuing though with that passion for writing. Everything threads back to writing for me. Um, after that moment, I uh, loved Denver for various reasons, ended up moving uh, to Chicago to get closer to family. And that was my foray into the talent industry. And that was back in 98. I started with a company called Interim, which then became Spherion and uh, now is uh, Ronstad. So as you get to know the industry, you'll know those are it's some of the biggest players in the space. Started again, internal communications, worked my way up into various uh, marketing roles. But again, the way I got into the role it was all through networks and connections. And this was in my 20s. It didn't hit me as much to know why that was so important. But if you think about it in your, at the time, now I reflect on it and realize how important that is. But you all being in the recruiting field, your network and your connections are your everything. And knowing that it's about the relationships, it's about the relationships and the network you create over time is so critical. And again, I didn't realize that I was still pretty naive at that point in my career. So I'm at Spherion, moving my way up, traveling the world, running global marketing for the technology division. And I fell in love with the industry. I fell in love with the talent space and I fell in love with technology. And I also continued to expand my knowledge on the marketing front. So here I thought, this is incredible. I've, I've kind of made it again. I've had these different phases of my life and career. Uh, I was basically told I either had to move to Atlanta because of multiple acquisitions we went through or find a new job in Chicago. I found a new job in Chicago, went to a smaller company, still in technology. And what I realized at that moment was they don't have the propensity to invest in marketing like the big players, yet they compete with the big players. So I decided this was an opportunity to start a company. Could we outsource marketing to companies who maybe don't have the full budget to invest in marketing and continue to get them to that next, that next level? And that was the kind of genesis of Clear Edge Marketing. So I started it 15 years ago. And what I realized is it's kind of like the Kevin Bacon, third, three degrees of separation, whatever the saying is, where as I look back 15 years, I can literally thread every single client, every single contact back to those interim Spherion days. Every single one in some way is connected back to that 15 years later. And it's those relationships and those networks and those connections that you continue to foster and grow that can really help and make a difference in, in your daily life. So I started Clear Edge and I get asked this question a lot. Did you always want to own your own company? And again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, no. And interestingly, my sister, who also works with us, we were at a company dinner probably three or four years in, and someone said, did you always know, like Leslie growing up, that she'd always be you know, this successful and, and see, see this in her? And my sister said, no. We did not. We were actually really concerned about Leslie. So it's interesting to think back to where I was. I always knew I had a vision of what my success would look like, but I always knew it would be my own path. So just because I wanted to do broadcasting and journalism and it didn't work out, or I waited tables and really used that opportunity to find myself, took a break after college um, to do that. And really for me, it's always being true and authentic to myself. And that leads into your network. It leads into your personal brand. It leads into the culture of the companies you pick and choose to go with. It really helps define, for me, my everything. And when I started Clear Edge, I knew I wanted to stay in the talent industry, and I knew I wanted to focus on technology to do with an agency uh, and really bring that to life. So back to the question, is this always something that I wanted to do? I was speaking to a group of uh, business school students at DePaul in Chicago, and that's where I'm based out of now is Chicago. And I got asked that question. And what I realized was it, it didn't, I didn't have a business plan. I was never in sales. I didn't have a lot of things um, that a lot of business owners have. Uh, and Allison, maybe you can relate to this a little bit with me too, but I had a vision and I knew there was a market need and an opportunity, 
And I just had faith in myself. I knew it would happen and I did not overthink it. I was also fortunate from a financial standpoint. I didn't have a lot of obligations. I was single. Um, I didn't have any children. I could make this switch and it wouldn't be really painful for me from an income standpoint. And keep in mind, I had come from not having any money. So I kind of knew what that was like and thought, I can do this. I can make this happen. And, and I did, and I, I trusted in that piece. Um, the other thing is what I realized in that moment when they asked me that question, partially why it didn't uh, impact me as much to think about starting a company was because I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. So my grandmother and her sisters had come over, uh, I'm Lebanese and Italian, and on the Lebanese side, they ended up landing in uh, Detroit and uh, going door to door. It started like door to door sales. They kind of called themselves gypsies that turned into selling like sheets and Catholic school girl and boy uniforms to actually starting clothing stores. And they had multiple stores throughout Michigan. And that was what I was raised in. I, I grew up in those stores. Um, those stores ended up going away over time, but that's what I saw. I saw really strong women leading companies. I saw the importance of uh, building relationships with their customers and customer satisfaction. I saw the importance of the culture and the opportunity they were creating for their staff. And I knew that that was something that was just kind of innate in me because I had, I had grown up uh, with that in my family. So for me, the risk wasn't that great because I just somehow, I just knew I could do it and that it, it would work. I had that, that faith. Going back to the network side, if you fast forward several years later, my friend Stacy, who I had mentioned, my high school friend who allowed me to sleep on her couch uh, for about six months until I could afford a futon and then we shared a bedroom. Um, I, she's actually in real estate now. So to go full circle with that, she's in real estate in Colorado. And I ended up getting married a little bit later in life and having uh, our son Grayson when I was 43. I think I was pregnant at 42. So a little bit, again, my own path, my own journey of doing things kind of that way. And uh, before we knew we were going to have kids, we decided, you know what, we can work from anywhere. Why not get a second home uh, in Colorado, which my husband had been ski patrol in Keystone uh, earlier in his, in his life as well. And both of our love and passion is Colorado. Obviously I moved out there twice before. So we decided to get a second home and Stacy, I called her and it was a really proud moment for me to be able to say, I need your help finding a house in Colorado. So to think about that full circle, had my neighbor not brought that piece of paper to me as I was driving away, you know, I really believe in watching for signs, paying attention to signs, and then also that network and those connections. So it ended up being something that kind of came full circle for me. Um, now, playing off the talent side and something that Allison mentioned early on, uh, I also firmly believe in, and this kind of goes to your passions and, and building different things, and if you do connect with me on LinkedIn, you'll see a lot of my posts are around DEI. I'm extraordinarily active when it comes to uh, serving uh, the minority space, underserved areas and communities that I live in and that I'm part of. And I started and co-founded a group called ARA, which is Attract, Retain, and Advance Women in Technology. We have over 6,000 people who have been part of that program. Uh, over the years, over the past eight years since we founded it. And it really came from my own experiences of uh, one, my own issues with microaggressions, my own challenges that I had growing up in my career, but then also seeing a lot of my really good friends leaving the workforce, leaving technology uh, because they were basically dealing with unfair work environments and poor treatment. And I knew that something had to be done. So two of my best friends and I started ARA with the intention of creating a mentoring platform to bring people together, but also looking at just helping people find their voice when it comes to confidence and being uh, 
confident and willing to use their voice in different situations and know that if they see something, they can be something and, and really drive that message home and give people an opportunity to have a network if they hadn't created one um, and, and really look at fostering women within technology and the workforce. So very active with that. Also in the talent space, uh, extraordinarily active with supporting women in recruitment and uh, driving through, I host an executive women in recruitment podcast. And the intention there is really to get the stories out of these, of these women who are driving our industry forward. And I, I hear stories of, actually, I'll use recruiting as an example. There was a rising star and I was a judge for this uh, program through Bullhorn. And I asked her, uh, tell me, you're, you want, you're like a finalist for this rising star. There's only three or four of you. Tell me, what's your vision? What are your goals and dreams? Now here, I'm thinking she must be really like into her career and what's happening to be a rising star after I'd heard her story. And she said, well, you know, one day I'm going to find someone and get married and have children and maybe I'll go into learning and training and development because I, I just don't think I could do this job. And I thought, oh my gosh, uh, you have to listen to this podcast and hear these stories because you can, you can do both. You have to find a way to be able to do that. And I knew being an entrepreneur, when people found out I was pregnant, the comments I got even of, oh, are you going to be closing your company now? as if I couldn't do both. It was really amazing to me. And keep in mind, that was only you know four or five years ago that people were saying that and still continue to say that. I continue to get uh, microaggressions on that front, being an entrepreneur and traveling a lot and trying to have a family. So um, you know, with that, I would say just a couple things in closing is I'm, I, to find a passion. To find something like for me, it's it's writing is my passion, and uh, I was able to take that passion on the career side and really help it develop and hone into what I'm passionate about and what I do for a living today. So you'll see I'm pretty active in, in writing different things and putting my voice um, out there for people and remembering about your network because I am, I am here to tell you your network is your everything, especially when it comes to recruiting. And there's a great author. I'm going to put a couple of um, links in here right now. Uh, Casey Jaycox. I know, Allison, you may be familiar with Casey. He came from um, K-Force. He was really a rainmaker uh, for K-Force. And what I mean by that is he was one of the company's absolute top performers. Um, he is now out on his own. And he published a book called It's About the Relationship, Not the Deal. And it's something that's so incredibly important to remember is you're building these relationships. And while you have to in recruiting and talent, sometimes it can feel like a numbers game. There's this opening, I need to fill it. But you're way more likely to fill it with someone who you have a relationship with. You're way more likely to convince the talent side, the hiring side to bring that person on board if you have a relationship with that person. It's about the relationship, not the deal. And those people will be just so um, loyal to you for so many years. Uh, it's unbelievable. One of my favorite recruiters, and I don't know, Allison, if Megan McCann has been on your show or not yet on part of this program, but she is a co-founder of ARA. Um, and she owns her own recruiting company out of Chicago. And one of the things I love about her is she has CIOs, CTOs, people who she has placed in roles for 10 plus years. It's like everywhere they go, they go with her and she brings them along. And it's because she has taken the time to actually build relationships, which is so incredibly important um, in everything that we do. I mean, talent, being people, persons, whatever it is that, you know, who you are, a key thing to that is the network is so critical and understanding the talent side um, of building those relationships because that is really critical. So I would encourage you to kind of read about Casey and different things with that. And then I'll just leave you with a couple things. So we talked about um, being confident. You know, this is something that it's interesting. We, we do an annual survey for ARA and for women in particular, confidence can be a real struggle. Be confident, know your net worth, 
look yourself in the mirror. My dad used to always say this to me. You have to love yourself first before anyone else can. And that is true in business. For you to advance and you to get more opportunities, you have to be confident in yourself and confident in yourself. And you, you have to be your own career champion first and foremost, not to wait on other people to do things for you, but to go for it. And remember, if you have that, we call it the evil DJ, that inner monologue or voice that goes off that tells you, I shouldn't be in this role. I shouldn't ask for that promotion. I shouldn't get that raise. They should be giving it to me. Should I, do I really deserve that? Shut that down. It usually stems from something. So it's deeper than just turning it off in some cases. Find out what that is and really turn that song that plays over and over in your head off. If for any reason you struggle with that, it's really important to do it. It's hard, but you can do it. Building the network like we talked about. And I know firsthand when I look at my company and deals that have come in and just all of that, it a thousand percent is in thanks to the network. And that started the second I graduated college. And again, it didn't hit me until I, uh, I really knew that um, longer in my career. So something that I love to share with people as well. Um, and just, you know, stay humble. Some of you are going to, hopefully all of you experience great success. Just remember, as we all know, uh, things can change overnight. So always remember to be humble and be that person people want to be around. And uh, always think about my, my purpose is to rise others up. It took me some time to figure that out. And I knew it in starting the company when we were helping, you know, we have a lot of moms on our team who maybe they have special needs children and their corporate jobs wouldn't allow them flexibility, whatever their why was, we kept taking them in on our company. And we have about 50 people on our team now. And a big piece of that was I wanted to rise them up. I wanted to give them opportunities that others wouldn't. So be true to yourself and what that is. Um, and, and then that will help you along the way. Um, and just something I love, a story I love is um, making sure if you don't ask, you won't get yes. You gotta ask in order to get yes. We do that with asking for speakers. We do it for asking the deal, whatever that may be. If you don't ask, you won't put yourself in a position for getting yes. And that is, is really um, something that's extraordinarily uh, critical. Um, and just stay true to yourself and be as uh, authentic as you possibly can be. I remember talking to uh, a developer actually in IT and she had uh, purple hair. She was going through a program that I sat on the board of called IC Stars and it's uh, inner city uh, young adults, they put through immersion technology programs. And she said, everyone keeps telling me to, to change my hair color, but that's not really who I am. Like, well, then maybe you haven't found the right company. You know, you really need to look at and be authentic to yourself because that will go with you a lifetime in your career. And it'll give other people permission to be themselves when they see you being yourself. And you know, when you get into a leadership role, if that's what you want to do, that you're going to treat other people that same way to bring them their whole selves to work, uh, no matter what is extraordinarily important. So with that, um, I certainly could go on and on, but I won't. I want to leave some time for questions. Um, another resource I wanted to share because we talked, Allison, a little bit about building your own personal brand. I'm going to put a link to it. It's a new book that just came out called B. Um, and uh, it basically, it's about being yourself, your authentic, like know your self-worth and your net worth by simply being yourself. But a lot of it is about building your personal brand. And again, I run a marketing company, but you don't see a lot of posts on LinkedIn from me about marketing, which is kind of interesting. I've been talking to my team about that a little bit lately. Like I need to get my expertise out there, but I'm really a thought leader on the DE&I and uh, women in recruitment and women in technology piece. And that's my passion and my soul and my purpose on rising people up. So I know if I stick to that and stick to building those relationships, that the rest will come. And I've been able to prove that, I guess, for 15 years now. So amazing, Leslie. Gosh, so many things, so many things. Um, question that came in from Bedelia, which was literally also the question I had in my head um, related to maintaining relationships. Um, and that, you know, on one hand, we do have transactional things, we got to get our work done. But on the other hand, relationships take some cultivation. And 
I, at least, you know, and, and as people with young families or, you know, parents that they're caring for, we all have, especially this year, we're all stretched so thin. What are, what are some things that you do, whether you are conscious of it or not, that you do to kind of keep in touch with someone that you haven't seen or talked to in three months? Or for me, I know uh, I kind of always struggled, like I always have work. And so I always feel like there's an alternative motive, ulterior motive. Um, that it can feel a little bit weird to just keep in touch with someone that I'm not trying to recruit or, or something like that. You know, I, how do you, how do you just stay in touch with people regularly? How do you, how do you cultivate your network, Leslie, in a natural sure. way? You know, for me, um, and this is something that is just for me. And one thing I want to mention is what's right for me may not be right for you. And what's right for you may not be right for me. Fair. So you kind of take these things in and you listen and you learn. And I hope that there's at least one nugget of something that I say today that you can walk away with and put into action for me. And everyone always talks about like separating like work-life balance for me, life and work are so intertwined. My best friends I met and grew up with in the industry. They were in my wedding. They, you know, they, I, Megan, who I mentioned is the godmother to my son you know, my life is intertwined. I go to a conference and staffing. I've been in this industry for over 20 years. I show up, it's like a reunion, but I show up. And that's the thing is if it's during the day and Allison knows this about me, like I'm very active in the different associations, but I'm very present in what I do. So if I'm at a meeting, I'm chatting people during the meeting, I'm following up with people after, I'm connecting with people on LinkedIn. It's just part of my nature. And in recruiting, it's going to be part of your nature too, more than likely to be successful, to keep building those networks. But I'm really focused. So people always ask me, you know, how do you do, you're on these boards, you, you're running two companies, how do you have time? And, you know, I, yes, I probably work too late sometimes. And yes, I overcommit. And yes, I need to learn how to say no more. All of those things that I coach and mentor other people on, I'm still learning. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but I'm very focused. So for example, the networks I keep are the groups that I'm most passionate about. So there's the staffing industry. So I pick within associations what I'm going to do. So I'm a mentor in ASA. I sit on the Women in Leadership Committee for ASA. Those are two things that I'm doing to keep my network strong in that industry. The other associations, I sponsor Women's Luncheon, and then I try to speak whenever I can at the other one. That's my focus within talent in the staffing industry. That's where I spend my time. Outside of that, I've got ARA. Within ARA, we've got three groups that we're really closely aligned to. I see stars, who I mentioned already, Shy Tech Academy, it's an inner city um, STEM high school and Be Wise, Black Women in Science and Engineering. I pick and choose focus areas and the, that's where I focus my time. So for example, with Be Wise, they're trying to get into more corporations, help people with diversity hiring, help people with DE&I. Now, when I'm talking to companies, I can connect them. I can put them in touch. I can help them in some way. And it, it helps both be wise, it helps us, and it helps the people I'm putting them in touch with. But I'm really focused on where I spend my energy and my time because I don't have a lot of time. And I also think about for staffing and the other things, it's going to benefit me professionally. It's also going to benefit me personally. So I really try to focus if I'm mentoring someone through an entrepreneur program, or I mentor now through Shy Tech Academy for the first time, a high school student, I've never done that before, but I really felt like I needed to, and that it was something that would benefit them and me and help the high school and give visibility to them. So I'm really intentional and focused with, with what I do. Um, Listen, I also have a really supportive husband. So he, you know, he has a job that, um, well, now he just started his own company, but he doesn't travel. And I do. I was traveling pre pandemic almost every other week. And he never questioned it. He never gave me a hard time. He knows my passion and my love for these things. I have evening events, daytime things. Um, if I didn't have him and his support, it would make it really, really difficult. And I will tell you, I've, I've had unsupportive 
situations in the past and it is like night and day. So having that really strong support network and then just being really intentional and really focused um, helps me. If, and specifically, I do try to keep up with on LinkedIn, um, commenting for people, doing different things. And you know, in today's day and age, that's a little bit of staying connected. And if I am reaching out to someone I haven't talked to in five, 10 years, I'm extraordinarily authentic in my outreach um, and not uh, just, hey, I've got this opportunity, would you be interested? I try to personalize it and make it in a way, a connection that um, makes it feel good and more human than work-related. That's a, that's a really good point too. And that was actually just a follow-up question that came in is, what is your advice for, um, you know, we can't keep everything warm at the same time, but you know, if something comes up and you are, we have, for example, Hannah's talking about, she's um, currently looking for a new role and she's thinking about people that she hasn't kept in touch with. And you know, I've had this too. Do you have any tips for sort of rekindling connections without it feeling like selfish or you know, pushing? It's more of a pull. Do you have any suggestions around that? Yeah, and I think everything is situational, but I would say in reconnecting with someone, one of the things that I do or advice that I give is people like to help other people. So if you, for example, Hannah, admire these people you're reaching out to because of where they've gotten in their career, you could simply use it as a, I'd love to just learn from you as I continue to grow in my career. So it's not about, I'm looking for a job, even though you are, you're kind of looking to build that relationship and rekindle that. You're someone I've admired from afar. I've kept an eye on your career. I'd love to meet with you and learn and grow from you. I don't have many mentors and I'm not asking you for a lot of time, a 20 minute virtual coffee catch up is all I need. So you kind of look at like people are usually willing to help. And if they can't, if they don't have the time or feel like they're the right person, don't, I wouldn't be afraid to ask them for someone else. Is there someone else in your network you think I could talk to or someone else at your company? Um, and then also, again, going back to if you don't ask, you don't get yes. So uh, just be authentic in the ask and make sure you make the ask. If you don't, then you'll never know what could have happened. That's a good point. And also I'm thinking too, from my experience, starting with just a warm connection and how are you? And then maybe in the second email, asking for more or proposing things. I know for myself, I'll have people ping me that I haven't heard from in years. And they're literally just asking me, do you know a salesperson? It's like, I haven't heard from you in a three years. Like I, if I do, I, obviously I will, but it's kind of nice more to do a, It's like a, a warm up, <laughs> right? Reconnection. Um, Allison, yes. though, if it's someone who I know is authentic and true and had a really good experience within the past, I feel better about that ask mm -hmm. than if it's someone who just out of the blue is trying to take advantage. So keep that in mind too. Like if you are that person who always gave and people know that about you and that you are a good person at heart, the ask is going to feel better to give to you than someone where, I mean, I have a lot of situations where I give, 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 I'm not getting anything. And sometimes that's okay. It comes back. I'm not saying I always have to give and get, but sometimes you feel taken advantage of. And in those cases, I just say enough is enough and kind of move on. You can only give so much. And I give a lot, a lot. So I try to just manage, um, manage that as much as possible. But if you're that person at heart that people know um, from past experiences of working with you, then they're more likely to say yes. Excellent point. Yes, and I, one thing I wanted to think about too is, um, as you're talking about, you know, uh, being confident and being humble. And I love what you're doing the mission with Ara in, in terms of if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, I think it was ASA that just put out a report on a survey that maximum there's 20% women in executive leadership in the staffing industry. Did you see that article? Yes. That is awful. <laughs> that is like jaw dropping, especially for an industry where I see a ton of women leaders to know that at the executive level, it's still four out of five are guys. And we know the industry, it's also very much predominantly white. What 
what do you have, you know, how do we, how can we be confident when it feels like there's this established ceiling and I'm really only going to be able to go so far. And then I'm going to have to think about my, about my family and, and do some other industry. Like that woman mentioned to you, like, what do you have to say for, first of all, the status of the industry at that, with that report. And then like, how do we be confident and grow when we know that the road isn't very well paved for, for us as women or, you know, uh, non-white uh, recruiters. And so I, I actually was on a panel this week to roll out that report. Okay. I'm business collaborative. And I'm part of the group who helped with the study. And I did it intentionally because I remember doing a little bit of research myself and seeing how few women there were in the C-suite. So I wanted to make sure that we had data to validate what we were feeling and the data validated it. It's 21% women in the C-suite, 4% women in the C-suite, women of color. It just dramatically goes down. 48% women in entry-level roles. So if you think about it, 50% of the staffing industry's workforce are women, yet only less than two in 10 make it to the C-suite. And there's so many various reasons why that has happened. The great thing is that we're having conversations now to change that. And part of that is flexibility. If you think about it with the pandemic, one of the positive things coming out of it is a lot of the staffing companies who weren't flexible now realize they have to be flexible. So for example, I was meeting with the CEO of a staffing company and his entire next level out of the C-suite were women regionally. But he insisted that everyone be located at the HQ at that executive level. Well, these are women with families. It was hard enough for them to go on a trip, let alone relocate. Their support systems were somewhere else. So finding those companies who, A, you can put yourself in that succession seat, is there an opportunity to go? So really thinking about that for the roles that you take, what is, am I in a succession seat to get into management leader, whatever that may be, if that's what you choose and what is their plan? You've got to, we've got to ask more questions. What is their plan? How are we going to get there? Do they have a plan to get there? And what kind of progress have they seen? Because even if they're not now, there are plenty of companies who are trying to. Signature Consultants is a great example. I love Signature. Jay Cohen was on our panel. He created a position at the table. So that's the other thing. Uh, Deliber Wesley, who's the CEO of Delta Companies, talks about this. I love this. Why do we have to stick to these C-suite positions? Why can't we add a seat at the C-suite table? And that's exactly what Signature did. They created a seat. Lydia Wilson came in, EVP at the company. And guess what? Since she's come on board, the women flocked around her. They have been able to, I believe it's now at least three or four, all of their latest MDs are all women. And it's creating this mentality of, it's not an us versus you or us versus them. We just want to seat at the table with you. We want to be next to you, lock arm in arm in partnership, but it's got to be equal. So I think the flexibility, having more women, again, that's why we do the podcast. So more women can see more women and hear more of their stories about how they did it. They didn't give up. They were resilient. Michelle McCauley from Apex, she was an up and comer, head of HR. They, she thought she was in a succession seat. They brought someone else in. She could have left and gone somewhere else, but you know what? She stayed. This is many, many years ago. She was one of their first employees. She stayed. She learned from that person. She ended up getting the job and taking on way more responsibility and starting their DNI, DEI practice for the company. So it's just, you know, knowing if you're at the right company, being resilient, asking the questions and, and pushing yourself. But um, there's a lot of reasons. It's, you know, if you think about it, Allison, when you look at the C suite and you read the bios, a lot of these guys went to college together. They grew up in these companies and then they recruited their friends who all look the same exact way. So if we don't start recruiting from different talent pools, diversifying at the entry level, but then also putting people in succession seats and sponsoring, men have to sponsor women into those seats too, not just mentoring. And by sponsor, I mean, put you up for that position. When there's a conversation, make sure that there's diversity at the table for that. Anyway, I, again, this is a topic I could go on and on for, but there's, there's a lot of things we can do. Fortunately, there's a lot of things we are doing and seeing. So I hope to God in the next three to five years, 
as you see generations leaving the C-suite and new generations coming up and people seeing it and saying it, having radically candid conversations, not sitting back, using their voices, um, we'll see some change. And I mean, part of that also goes in with that, the, the be confident thing. I, I, saw, I read an extra, uh, a great article from Harvard Business Review talking about the concept of imposter syndrome and that that term was coined in the 70s. And that was really as it related to a white woman's experience, because we didn't have intersectionality back then. And how, especially in the US, when we look at power dynamics, we almost mm -hmm. always pay attention to the victim and not the system. And really, it's the system that needs to change, not the people. And so it's natural that underrepresented people uh, feel imposter syndrome, but it's not them, it's the system that is making them feel that way. And so the more that we can change the system, the less it's on us to be, you know, smarter, shinier, faster, it's more on being able to meet us there. And so that's great to hear that, you know, the, A, I'm, I'm super happy that you are part of that research and that you helped to get numbers out there because then it's, we have something to point to, but it does make sense that as we see more people and the system starts to reflect more of, of us, we start to feel more comfortable. We start to feel more confident. We can be more authentic because we're not trying to fit into a system designed for and by people that are not us. And right. so it's it's fun to see that movement. Um, what was the name of your podcast? It's called The Edge. I'll put it up here so you have it. Yeah, um, you have a whole resource list. I know you had a request from the, the book as well. So maybe- I uh, did drop that in. I yeah, and if you could- in. Is Ara something that we can follow or listen? Please join Ara, follow oh, us, um, be part of it. It's um, free to attend our events. Um, we're working on our event series for this year, but we did just launch an allyship in action hub. That is a replay of our, we had a, a series last year of five events. I highly, highly encourage you. We had, um, this is the podcast here. I'll put the hub up there too. There was one about, um, the uh, invisible talent. It was a phenomenal, uh, a phenomenal event on uh, just how people are completely overlooked for uh, roles in technology and be wise uh, black women in science and engineering is their, their story and what they run into and just listening to it and learning from it. It is, uh, it is truly unbelievable. Um, so it's, you know, a big piece of it is bringing to light these different things. That's why I mentioned even with the podcast, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. But the other thing is, and when I interview these women, it's so fascinating to me because, and I'm, I'm quite frankly, one of them, you know, microaggressions are things that have happened and we just kind of let it go for a lot of years in growing up in the industry and being comfortable and confident, um, to say something takes some time and confidence to do it. And what I love about where we are right now as a society is that, and I, I mean, I'm telling you C-suite executive after another, these women who switched companies because of situations they went through. I even have a good friend who kept applying for a job and uh, they would change the job description whenever she would apply just because they didn't want her in that position. And do you know, she stayed in that industry for 18 years. It's like, why, why did we do this? Why? And now we're at a point where um, you have people like us stepping up and standing up and saying no more, this just can't keep happening. And a lot of men in our industry are doing the same. Kip Wright uh, from Genuine, he is one of the leaders of the survey. And there's a lot of men who are part of that program and, and allies to us who want the education. They want to know what they can do, what they can say, how they can help and be part of changing it because they know they've seen it firsthand that having a diverse workforce makes a big difference within their companies. So it's, it's really critical. Now is the time. And, and I'm just grateful. I think of my career and, and going back in time in situations where I didn't say anything. Um, what I noticed though, was that I was surrounded by women who did say something and they were a little bit later in their careers. I even had um, someone in our industry stick up for me in a situation. And I remember saying, she used her voice to help me here. She rose me up in a situation where I was having imposter syndrome and I need to do the same to make sure this doesn't happen to other women 
or disenfranchised who maybe are in a position where they're feeling the same way. It's just not right. But the more we see it and say it and practice radical candor that comes from the heart in a really good, positive place, the more we can make change. Mm. Goosebumps. Mm. Exactly. Leslie, we are so fortunate to have you in our industry and to have this time with you. We've got a ton of resources that we're going to follow up with our entire group and share with. Um, what maybe to, to kind of close things out as for our audience, specifically folks that are really growing uh, their career in, in recruiting, specifically in tech recruiting, do you have a, a piece of advice for them in terms of how to, yeah, sort of just, I mean, you've been talking about a lot of nuggets on how to build your network and, and, and be authentic. What's, what's maybe one piece of advice for people who are really starting their career in recruiting and talent? For me, it always comes back to a little bit what we talked about earlier. When I when I look at the most successful um, recruiters in our industry, who again I used the word rainmaker earlier, uh, it's those who really focus on the relationship. And I know it can be hard when you're focused on numbers and placements and all of those things. But when you build a relationship with one person, it's going to refer other people into you. And then you can build a relationship with them who then refer people in. Our business is 100% referral based. And it's because of the relationships and the time we've taken to really cultivate that. And then again, just really stay true to your values. If you work at a company where they're not practicing the same practices you would when it comes to recruiting, it may not be the best or right company. Maybe they need to learn and you can help them change. If not, then don't be afraid to use your, you know, your passion of what you do and, and move on from that. Um, your, your passion, another person to think about following Anna Frazetto, she started out, it's Anna Frazetto, and I can send you a link to her, but she was in technology and um, now is in sales and one of the top fee earners for her company. And I can tell you firsthand her passion for helping and rising up people, her passion for her network, her passion for building relationships. It is a thousand percent what, what has driven to her success. And time and time again, when I look at Casey talks about being good, great and elite, the elite, they follow up, they follow through, they do what they say they're going to do. They're passionate and love what they do. And um, they're just, they're real, they're human. And, and that's really, really important. Mm, wonderful. Yes, thank you. I So much to take away from this conversation, Leslie. And I'm excited to follow up on some of these resources. And I will definitely be sharing your uh, Aura and your, your podcast with our group. Because I know, you know that this group is really hungry to, to grow and, and develop themselves and I'll do it as a community with each other. So we'll, we'll definitely have some follow-ups within the group too, um, as we get to, to, to learn more about what you've shared. So on behalf of, of the, the cohort, the Ernest e. McClendon Talent Grant cohort, Leslie Vickery, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, thank you for having me. And please, I didn't get to know any of you. So this feels really one-sided. Please reach out to me. I would be more than happy to connect with you and take the time to uh, help you. And I mean that sincerely. So good luck to all of you and your careers and your paths, wherever your journey may take you. And uh, remember to build that network, reach out, connect, and I'd, I'd love to help you in any way I can. Wonderful. Thank you, Leslie, and uh, thanks to everyone that joined us, and thanks to all the folks that will be enjoying this uh, conversation afterwards. So have a great rest of your day, and uh, may the spring weather come quickly. Yeah, thank you, Allison. And thank <laughs> thank you. you. Bye, Leslie. Doing this grant. Thank you. For Pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.